everyone, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Rachel. I'm an archaeologist. And like many other archaeologists, one of the things that inspired me towards this career as a child were the Indiana Jones films. Dr. Jones is undoubtedly one of, if not the, most recognizable archaeologists in pop culture. And so in the lead up to the release of the fifth film, I am digging deep into the archaeology featured in the previous installment. Last week, I did Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you haven't watched it, it's linked here and in the description down below. Today I'm discussing the archaeological methods, site, and artifacts portrayed in the second film, The Temple of Doom. Are the Shankara stones real? Did the Thuggy exist and sacrifice people to Kali? I'll be answering these questions and more in my video today. Before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the bell button so you can know right away when the next video in the series covering the last crusade comes out. Also, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up to help me out with the algorithm so that more people can see it. A subscribe or a like is very much appreciated as it helps support me and the videos that I make on this channel. All right, guys, let's dig in. So right off the bat, I want to say out of the whole series, this is the least archeological film in that there are no archeological sites or really any archeological methods used in this film besides Indiana Jones reading or translating a piece of Sanskrit text at the beginning. Like Raiders, this film does draw on real elements of Hindu and Indian culture. However, it twists them into something that's quite dark. It's been accused of racism and negative stereotyping of Indian culture. Watching the film, you can definitely tell that it was made in a time where people were not nearly as conscious or respectful of these cultures as they are now. So you really have to be aware of the fact when you watch it that it was made 40 years ago. Reading into the making of this film, it appears that the tone was very much influenced by the relationship breakup slash divorces going on in the personal lives of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg at the time that it was made. Additionally, the film was actually denied permission to film in India because the Indian government found it offensive. Personally, it was my least favorite film in the series until the fourth one came out and it definitely traumatized me as a child and gave me nightmares. That being said, let's move on to the few archeological slash historical elements that are mentioned in the film. Set in 1935, it begins in Shanghai with a scene of the female lead, Willie Scott, dancing and singing a Mandarin version of Anything Goes. This musical first debuted on Broadway in 1934. So it's actually a really historically accurate choice for the opening number, as it would have probably been very popular at this time. Actress Kate Capshaw learned to tap dance and sing in Mandarin for the role. However, due to the tightness of her dress, she didn't end up doing the dancing part. The scene then progresses to Indiana negotiating with crime boss Lao Chi about handing over an urn containing the ashes of the first Qing emperor, Nirhachi. He was a real person. He was a Jurchen chieftain best known for his military campaigns that united numerous Jurchen tribes and conquered Northeast China. He created the Eight Banners, an administrative and military system that divided and organized the tribal family. He is also generally credited with ordering the creation of a new written script for the Manchu language, based on the Mongolian vertical script. In 1626, Nurhachi was defeated by a Ming general at the Battle of Ningyuan. His remains are kept at his tomb, Fu Mausoleum, which is located east of Shenyang, which had been his capital city. In 1635, the Jurchen renamed themselves the Manchu. Nurhachi's accomplishments set the stage for the Manchu to conquer the rest of China and form the Qing dynasty, which lasted from 1644 to 1912. He was retroactively named an emperor and given the temple name Emperor Taizu of Qing. His mausoleum served as the main site for ritual ceremonies conducted by the imperial family during the entire Qing dynasty. The custom of that time was to be cremated, and while I couldn't find any details about what his ashes are currently kept in, a jade urn, as shown in the movie, is a good guess, as jade was the imperial gem of China and was considered more valuable than gold or silver. After some pretty unbelievable stunts involving airplanes and whitewater rafting through the Himalayas, Indy, Willie, and his sidekick Short Round find themselves in northern India and eventually wind up at Pankot Palace. This location is entirely fictional and was created for the movie. It was originally intended to film Pankot Palace at Amar Fort in Jaipur, the capital of Rajasthan. But as I mentioned, this permission was denied due to the government finding the film offensive. Because of this, they ended up filming in Kandy, Sri Lanka, 
with map paintings and scale models applied for the villages, temple, and Pencott Palace. The building Pencott was supposed to be filmed in, Amur Fort, is a historical building that once served as the palace for the Rajput Maharajas and their family. Laid out on four levels, each with a courtyard, it features both Muslim and Hindu architectural styles. During the dinner scene, we have quite a few historical references, and I also want to mention the food, as it is one of the biggest sources of criticism for the film. The dishes, such as baby snakes, eyeball soup, beetles, and chilled monkey brains are not all Indian food. Actually, consuming the brain and other nervous system tissues of some animals is considered hazardous for human health. Actor Roshan Seth, who played the Maharaja's Prime Minister Chatar Lal, mentioned that the banquet scene was, and I quote, intended as a joke that Indians were so smart that they knew all Westerners thought that Indians ate cockroaches, so they served them what they expected. The joke was too subtle for that film. I agree. Definitely too subtle. That completely went over my head as a child and even when I was watching it, if I didn't know that, I wouldn't have thought that. As a child, I was actually kind of scarred by watching that scene and now looking back, I wonder if it actually contributed to my overall unwillingness to try Indian cuisine until I finally got over my fussiness and discovered how amazing it was when I was an adult. I, I'd never ate it as a kid. Another event mentioned here is the mutiny of 1857 which is a real historical event. It was a major uprising against the rule of the British East Indian Company by sepoys, Indian infantry soldiers who were recruited into the company's army. Just before the rebellion, there were over 300,000 sepoys in the army compared to about 50,000 British soldiers. It is most popularly known as the Indian Rebellion of 1857. However, referring to it as a mutiny in the film is accurate as India was still under the rule of Britain in 1935 when the film is set. As a side note, Maharani Lakshmi Bai of Jhansi was a leading figure in this rebellion. As a result, she is often regarded as a national hero of India. I've read a book and watched a few Indian films about her, and she's a really fascinating historical figure. Getting back to the film, Indy brings up the Thuggy cult and their human sacrifices to the goddess Kali, which end up being the main villains of the film. There are quite a few things to unpick here, but honestly, it was really difficult to determine the difference between fact and fiction when it comes to what we know about the Thuggy because much of what is written about them is based on biased British accounts. These tend to come from when the British conducted a campaign to eradicate the Thuggy. So if I get any of this wrong, I apologize. It is generally accepted that the Thuggy group did exist. It's actually where we get the word Thug from. The first documented mention of Thugs in India is in a historical document that dates to 1356. The earliest recorded traditions about the origins of the Thugs date to 1760, and there was a general consensus among them that they originated in Delhi. They considered it sinful to kill women, bards, musicians, and dancers. An interesting note given that in the film they tried to sacrifice Willie, who falls under more than one of those categories. As opposed to being a secret cult bent on some kind of world religious domination, real life thuggy were essentially highway bandits that robbed and occasionally killed travelers. They did worship Kali, however they did include Muslims in their ranks and the extent of the ultimate religious nature of the killings that they did has been debated. In some instances, it is thought that they actively killed people as sacrifices to Kali, believing that they were avoiding her wrath on all mankind by satiating her need of destruction. Today, it is more commonly believed that the Thuggy had few religious ties and were merely bandits who violently murdered people to gain wealth. Interestingly, the Garot is often depicted as a weapon of the Thuggy. This is because of a Mughal Empire law, which stipulated that for a murderer to be sentenced to death, he or she must have had shed the blood of their victim. Victim. Those who murdered but did not shed blood might face imprisonment, hard labor, and paying a penalty, but they would not risk execution. To be honest, I think this is nodded to in the film when a thuggy tries to garrot Indiana Jones in his room. Next, we're going to talk about Kali. However, I am not an expert on the incredibly complex Hindu religion, so I'm going to try and keep it brief. Kali, whose name means the black one, is the Hindu goddess of ultimate power, time, destruction, and change. She is Shiva's bloodthirsty companion said to be a ferocious slayer of evil, not a perpetuator of evil. She has several forms but is usually depicted as a human woman with black or blue skin and forearms. Animal sacrifice is offered at many Kali temples, even in modern day, particularly in East India, which involves the slaying of goats, chickens, and sometimes male water buffalo. According to legend, Kali looks after those who satiate her bloodlust by bringing wealth to the poor, 
revenge to the persecuted, and children to the infertile. Based on what I read, you could probably argue that people did sacrifice humans on occasion to Kali in the past. However, it would not have been done as a means to amplify her power so that she could defeat all other religions. It seems to be more something to be for personal benefit and or in the historical Thuggy instance to prevent her from destroying the world. At the end of the day, she is seen more as a protector goddess than an evil one. One of the most out there parts of the plot is when the Maharaja has a voodoo doll of Indy that is then used against him. This is completely out of context artifact for the entire film. Voodoo is an African diasporic religion, particularly popular in Afro-Caribbean group, but it also has its origins in West African religious traditions, so it's completely out of place in India. The myth of voodoo dolls was actually promoted as a part of the wider negative depictions of African Americans and Afro-Caribbean religious practices in the United States. Practices of using a doll or effigy of a person to cause them harm can actually be found all over the world, but not in specifically voodooism or as far as I could find Hinduism. Now we're going to talk about the main artifact of the movie, the Shankara stones. These stones, as they are described in the movie, do not exist. However, they are based on real life Shiva Linga, abstract representations of the Hindu god Shiva. These are typically the primary devotional image in Hindu temples and shrines dedicated to Shiva. They're fairly common in India and they're not referred to as sacred stones outside of the movie. There are several different types of them and they can be made of several different materials. Some of them are even small enough to be worn as amulets or necklaces. The theme of the village losing their stone is actually somewhat accurate as today Hindu idols are still trafficked out of India and Nepal to sell. When communities lose an ancestral icon, which is often considered a manifestation of the god, it can be devastating for them. The film says that the stones were originally given to a priest of Shiva named Shankara, who climbed Mount Kalisa. This seems to be a reference to the Hindu Vedic scholar and philosopher Adi Shankara, who helped usher in a major revival of Hinduism in the 8th century CE. This time in Indian history was one of political instability, where power became decentralized and led to regionalization of, of religiosity and religious rivalry. Local cults and languages were enhanced and the influence of Brahmic ritualistic Hinduism was diminished. Hagiographies portray Shankara as a victor who traveled all over India to help restore the study of the Vedas. However, Reliable information on Shankara's actual life is scant, as his existing biographies were all written 700 years after his time and are rife in legends and improbable events. Mount Kalisa, or Mount Kailash, is, as it's also known, is a mountain in the Trans-Himalaya mountain range. In Hinduism, it is traditionally recognized as the abode of Shiva, who resides there along with his consort goddess Parvati and their children. For varied reasons of the different faiths that revere the mountain, Setting foot on its slopes and attempting to climb it is forbidden. As I mentioned at the beginning, there is virtually no actual archaeology done in this film. The only scene you can think of is perhaps when Indy is reading a text brought to him by an escaped child. But at this point, he's apparently so proficient at reading Sanskrit that he doesn't even need a notebook to help him with the translation. I will, however, make mention of possibly the greatest archaeology pickup line I've ever heard. And what sort of research would you do on me? Nocturnal activities. You mean like what sort of cream I put on my face at night? What position I like to sleep in? Mating customs. Love rituals? Primitive sexual practices. So you're an authority in that area? Years of field work. I mean, you can't argue with that. It's true. <laughs> All right, guys, that's everything for today. What do you think of the Temple of Doom? Do you like it or do you avoid it like me? Let me know in the comments down below. If you made it all the way to the end and you liked this video, please take a moment to give it a thumbs up to tell the algorithm to recommend it to people. Next week, we take on The Last Crusade. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button so you can watch it as soon as it comes out. Thanks for watching. Bye.